Hi, Professor Bromsky. How are you? Hey, I'm good. I haven't seen you in a while. How are you? I know it feels like a long time. I'm fine. I'm much. I, I, did I see you since the election? Well, we're seeing each other every four weeks. So I would think you saw me just before or just after. Just before, right. I feel like every guest that I haven't seen, I want to celebrate with just briefly. Uh, <laughs> even if Biden wasn't our first choice, it's so long, so, hopefully, to our orange nemesis here. Um, Sasha, you've joined us on the show today to talk about uh, the post-Trump world. Even as a one-term president, Trump's arrogance toward our democratic institutions is likely, uh, as you've said, to leave a long-term mark. Will anything less than prosecuting him for his crimes be enough to hold him accountable for the damage he's done? Sasha Abramsky here to give us his thoughts. As you know, he is a uh, freelance journalist and teaches journalism at UC Davis, but moreover, writes the Signal Noise column twice weekly for The Nation magazine. Sasha, again, thanks for joining us. Your thoughts on, uh, you know, what the Trump administration is doing with its final hours to solidify its inhumane and destructive legacy. Let's start there. Well, I, I no surprise, it's not slowing down. So, you know, anyone who thought, all right, the election's going to happen, we're going to have a sort of 10-week transition process, and it's going to be normal, because normally in transition processes, the outgoing president kind of slows down, they make room for the incoming agenda, they help facilitate the transfer, they work with the incoming cabinet members, the support staff, and so on. Anyone who thought that was going to happen was it's crazy. Not been paying attention. Yeah. Right from the get-go, Trump has said, I'll accept the election result if I win, and I won't if I don't. And he didn't win, and no surprise, he hasn't accepted the election result. And so you're, what you're seeing is a sort of twinned exercise in sabotage. So on the one hand, you're having Trump policies locked into place with this rush of regulatory actions, this rush of um, overhauls of the bureaucracies and um, firings of key personnel in different departments. That's sort of one act of sabotage because it makes it more likely the transition will be chaotic. The second act of sabotage, I think, is even more profound because, you know, the, the, the first one will get beyond it. By January or February, Biden will be putting his own team in place. And we'll get beyond, you know, these petty acts of sabotage. The more durable thing that Trump is doing is daily he is sowing the seeds of destruction for the democratic culture. So he's tweeting, he's talking, he's giving interviews. In each case, what he's saying is, don't believe the election results. It was a scam. It was rigged. It was a con. It was, you know, whatever language he uses. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous Even because... Bill Barr in came out and said, ah, uh, sorry, you lost today. I thought that was interesting. Sorry, who said that? Bill Barr. Yeah, I mean, look, everybody apart from the One America News Network and these various other conspiratorial sites is basically telling Trump to get over it. And, you know, the analysis is, oh, Trump's a petulant child. He just needs time to get over it. Well, you know, nonsense. Trump's a 74-year-old man. He's the most powerful human being on earth at the moment. He has no room to have a hissy fit. That, that, that just isn't room in the American constitutional system, especially in the middle of a pandemic, for a powerful man like Trump to just have a psychological hissy fit. That, that, that's just unacceptable. But that's what he's doing. And the danger is that for millions of his supporters, they not only sort of don't believe that Biden won, but they come to have no faith in the democratic process. And that's really dangerous. I mean, that, that's what's happened in other eras in history, in other countries with catastrophic results. When you have the conservative side of the political process basically walking away from the democratic system, that's the road to authoritarianism or fascism. Now, whether we go down that road, that's another story. But that's the route that Trump is mapping out. And so you asked at the beginning, you know, how do we get beyond? What I wrote in my last column was, if there was any doubt, and there shouldn't have been, but if there was any doubt about the wisdom or need to prosecute Trump for his myriad crimes a few weeks ago, that doubt's been removed because it's absolutely imperative that Trump be destroyed as a political force at this point because the Talk movement he is leading <laughs> is fascist. It, it's an anti-democratic system that he is advocating now. If the people reject me, I would people. That's what he's saying. And he's saying, if the people reject me, I will still stay in power 
and I will do so through something other than the will of the people. Now, he won't. He won't stay in power. But that is the rhetorical device he is now using. And it is so dangerous to the future of democracy. So for that reason alone, there's no room for forgiveness of Trump. There's no room to say, you know, let bygones be bygones. We know he committed crimes. We know he committed, you know, all sorts of malfeasance. You know, yeah. And, you know, there should never have been any doubt that he was worthy of prosecution, but especially not now, because he's now waiting war on the entire democratic infrastructure of this country. Oh, uh, do you think that do Trump might run for office? I, I hear an echo, so I'm not sure if we can adjust that. But um, do you think that Trump might run for office again? And how can we prevent that from happening? I actually don't. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of sort of hysteria out there that, you know, Trump will go away, but he'll still be a presence, you know, pulling the, the strings and he'll come back in 2024 and that he'll be this sort of zombie creature who never dies. I actually don't believe it. I think that once Trump is out of office, his nonsense will be seen by an increasing number of people, including Republicans, to be the nonsense that it is. Um, you know, he's been blathering for the last four years, but he's been blathering from a presidential podium. Now he'll be blathering as a private citizen and it's ugly and it's vaguely senescent and it's, you know, it's it's kind of but insane. But you don't have that former President Donald Trump. And, you know, most former presidents didn't start a cult while they were in office. I can't think of one who actually has. So he does have a sort of cult leader leadership that I think might be beyond just private citizen. If Jimmy Carter started getting mad about things and trying to lead a revolt, it wouldn't likely go so far because he hadn't built up a base of um, fascists and, and fascist lights uh, to to find him. What do you, how we're going into a brave new world here? Yeah, look, I think Trump's cult is not going anywhere. But I also think that Trump's cult is limited in its appeal. So you have the Republican Party and, you know, for various opportunistic reasons, the entire Republican apparatus coalesced around Donald Trump after he won in 2016. That will disappear. The moment he's out of power, all of these cowards who have sort of kept silent from one atrocity to the next, to the next, to the next, suddenly will develop a little bit of a spine. Not because they're, you know, necessarily more courageous, but because the political calculus has changed. Um, Trump's cult won't go anywhere, as I said, but it will no longer be an electoral powerhouse capable of bringing tens or, you know, more than tens of millions of people into an electoral coalition. And I do believe that. I, I think that a year or two out from now, we'll look back on this moment and think, you know, why did we ever think it was possible for Trump to run for re-election in 2024? I just don't see that happening. I, I really your, don't. Your thoughts about the critique that warns against prosecuting a president after they leave office because it sets a new, potentially dangerous precedent? It should be used extraordinarily sparingly because nobody wants a politicized justice system. And when Trump was calling for, you know, locking up his political opponents or arresting Joe Biden on the campaign trail, all the stuff he campaigned on, you know, that was absolutely horrific. But if you have a president or anybody else, private citizen, who has a litany of high crimes, directly traceable to him. And, he, you know, he, he would have been indicted for instruction of justice if he hadn't been the president. He would have been indicted on campaign finance charges. He's, he's the unindicted individual number one in the case involving Michael Cohen. There's a whole paper trail of crimes for which we know he's guilty because he's basically already had the evidence laid out against him. He just wasn't prosecuted because he was president. So if you have a pathologically criminal individual, they should be prosecuted. Now, it's entirely likely Trump won't be prosecuted at the federal level precisely because it will be seen as being this sort of politically unsavory thing to do. But I suspect in that case, he'll be prosecuted in New York at the state level where he's you know, clearly vulnerable to a whole host of charges, including tax fraud and various campaign finance um, charges. He could even be charged on money laundering because there's a whole bunch of evidence out there that his businesses were being used to launder money from Eastern Europe. Now, again, who knows if he will be prosecuted or not, but it's certainly possible. And if he is, it's not act an act of political vengeance. It's actually an act of blind justice. It certainly sets a bad precedent that you can 
go into office, do all kinds of, you know, illegal actions and just walk out scot-free because someone gave you the office. I mean, I don't understand how a president should be above the law. And I don't understand the thinking that would even occur to people to have a president be above the law. The first is there's a legal nonsense that we adhere to in this country and have adhered to since the Watergate era, which is this nonsense that the DOJ has this sort of, it's not, it's not a constitutional thing. It's not a legal thing. It's just an opinion. The DOJ has an opinion that a sitting president can't be charged with crimes. Now, if we're going to be a country ruled by law, that doesn't make any sense at all. But that, you know, that's the precedent. That's what's going to be the case. But this idea that beyond that, anything the president did while president can't subsequently be prosecuted after the fact, that makes no sense at all, especially in Donald Trump's case, where there's this entanglement of his personal corruption with his political responsibilities. And you sort of talk about the unprecedented place we're in. You know, there have been corrupt presidents in the past. Uh, Harding in the early 1920s, deeply corrupt president. Many of the late 19th century presidents, deeply corrupt. And the Congresses were corrupt too. But there hasn't been a moment in American history where one family has used and abused high power strictly for personal profit in the way the Trumps have. And it's not just Donald Trump. It's his sons, Eric and Donald. It's Ivanka and Jared Kushner. There's a sort of syndicate there. And, you know, this idea that you could have Secret Service personnel renting out rooms in Trump hotels and that you could have foreign countries basically paying to pay by paying these hugely inflated rental prices at Trump properties. This stuff is well documented. It's been written about. It's been investigated. It's been looked at by prosecutors. There's a lot of smoke here. There's enough smoke here to think there's a legal fire. And in that instance, by all means, Trump should be open to prosecution. And, you know, I really do what I argued in my signal noise column. Not prosecuting him at this point is politically more dangerous than prosecuting him. I find it interesting that Democrats are all it was. Isn't it kind of a funny neck at at neck breaking speed all of a sudden democrats are like we got to trust the election trust it we must trust it when for years it's been our side who has been disenfranchised uh people thrown off voter rolls i i do think we need to trust the results of the election obviously but uh, you know given the fact that they've been the right has been undermining um people's voting rights for the last at least two decades it it certainly seems like we've had to we've had to we've had to change our talking points uh, quite quite quickly. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I agree. Look, I, I, when I was a young journalist back in the early two thousands, I spent a lot of time writing about ways in which the GOP, in particular, um, both at the federal level but much more at the state and the county level, was working to undermine access to the ballot. And so you'd see it in Florida through felon disenfranchisement. You'd see it in places like Cuyahoga County in Ohio, where, you know, there were there were huge problems with access to voting. You, you'd have polling stations that weren't opening on time. You'd have voting machines that hadn't been pre-tested properly and would just break down on Election Day. And this would always be in poor neighborhoods and it would always be in, in minority neighborhoods, in black and Latino neighborhoods. And so there are legitimate reasons to be concerned about the way elections function in this country. We know that if you're poor, you're going to wait longer in line to vote. If you're a student, you're going to find it harder to access the ballot. If you don't have photo ID, which a lot of older poor people especially do not have, you're going to find it harder in many states to access the ballot. So there are problems. The answer isn't to sort of throw out the baby with the bathwater and say the whole election system is a failure, it doesn't work. The answer is actually to expand election security, to expand voter access, to make it easier to register to vote and to make it easier on Election Day and before Election Day to actually cast votes. And not forget the fact that that the electronic voting machines owned by some nefarious characters that we don't have to get into right now 
that's still a problem, is it not? It's a problem. And look, Trump, Trump has sort of manipulated that argument and talked about, you know, votes flipping from Republicans to Democrats, et cetera, et cetera. I don't actually think that's what's happening. I don't think it happened with Democratic votes being flipped to Republicans or Republican votes being flipped to Democrats. There may have been isolated instances over the last several election cycles where machines malfunction. I don't think there's a systematic national conspiracy to use these machines nefariously, but I do think there's a danger. And the danger is we farmed out a vital part of our civic infrastructure to for-profit private companies that produce these machines at speed, some of which are better than others and some of which are worse than others. And several states don't have paper trails and several counties don't have paper trails. Now, you know, the safest, surest safeguard to any election system is having a paper backup to every ballot. That's just common sense because machines do malfunction. They're vulnerable to cyber attacks. They go down if they're power cuts, et cetera, et cetera. So why not have a paper backup? That's just an easy fix. But here's the irony. I mean, you talked about the Democrats being in this weird position of saying, you know, our elections were secure and safe. The Democrats, for the last many, many years, have pushed for election security legislation and they've pushed for funding to shore up the election system. And they've also pushed for a modified and modernized version of the Voting Rights Act to protect access to the ballot. And on every single instance, Mitch McConnell's Republicans in the Senate have stymied this. So the idea now that the Republicans can turn around and say, well, the election was flawed, it was, you know, wrong people were voting, et cetera, et cetera. This is nonsense because the Republicans have done everything they possibly can to keep election systems vulnerable because they played a political game where they thought it would benefit them if they could shrink the franchise. And so, so now, you know, now they're turning around and crying wolf. This is an absurdity. As we move into the future, into the Biden administration, how can we shore up our democratic institutions in this post-Trump world, and hopefully, and and how can we restore a public faith in our democracy? How can we restore our democracy so that so that there can be a public faith in it? Well, you know, some of this is actually quite easy. Um, you can make it easier to register to vote. So you, you can have a modernized version of the Voting Rights Act that outlaws some of the shenanigans that we've been seeing in recent years where states have gone after voting rights. So you could have a uniform way of registering to vote. That still means you would have local control over elections, but it would reduce this sort of politicization of the actual access to the ballot. That's easy. You could institutionalize early voting as the norm rather than the exception. So, you know, one of the lessons learned in the pandemic election that we just went through is we got very creative about expanding access to the ballot because it was so dangerous to vote in person. So we made it the norm rather than the exception to have mail-in voting. We made it the norm rather than the exception to have a month of early voting in many states. We expanded the number of places that you could vote early. So if it worked in 2020, why not do it again in 2022 and 2024 and you know all the other post-pandemic elections? That's easy. Um, but I think beyond that, there has to be a really concentrated effort to say, if you're over the 80, age of 18 and you're a citizen in this country, you have a constitutional right to vote. So felon disenfranchisement in Florida, that's not going to happen. Wholesale voter purges in Georgia or in Wisconsin, that's not going to happen. Now, you know, if you do that, you solve a lot of the problems. You still need election security. You still need investments in cybersecurity. You still need maybe above all counters to disinformation campaigns and rumor campaigns. So I think, you know, that's a slightly different conversation. But if you're going to have reforms designed to expand access to voting and to make voting more secure, you've also got to actually tackle this idea of systemic disinformation on social media, especially because one of the things we've learned in the Trump era is disinformation spreads like wildfire. And if you have a sort of ruthless, authoritarian, manipulative political figure like Trump and the support systems around Trump in an era of Facebook and Twitter and all the other sort of social media systems, there's a real risk that rumor swamps fact. And I think that's a core part of a polit you know, political conversation down the road. If we want a more informed electorate, we've got to grapple with these disinformation mechanisms.
Sasha, do you think an important part of rebuilding public faith in democracy would be keeping the cabinet and cabinet level positions as well as say you know people who had their different agencies the food and drug administration the uh, EPA to keep them free of corporate lobbyists and corporate interests because it seems to me that it's not just faith in our ability to uh, it's not just our faith in our ability to vote that's that's at hand that's been undermined it's faith in the workings of all areas of the democracy I think that's true. And, you know, this is not something you can lay all the blame on Donald Trump. You can't even lay all the blame on the Republican Party. Both political parties for you know, 50, 60 years at this point have used and abused the political process and brought corporate lobbyists in and um, traded political favors in a sort of pretty unsavory way. And, you know, partly that's just the sausage making process of politics. But it certainly reached a point where it has corroded public confidence in government. And As it turns out, sausage is bad for you. <laughs> it out, sausage is bad for you, yes. <laughs> Even though it tastes pretty good. Um, you know, if partly it's a legal problem. There, there were a series of Supreme Court rulings, in particular Citizens United, that opened up a vast amount of dark money flowing into politics. And if you're going to have court protections, basically, for pay to play, if you're going to have court rulings that say it's absolutely all right to throw millions of dollars of dark money in and basically buy access to the political process, it makes it really, really hard to clean up politics. And, you know, you can try. Obama's government was pretty ethical in by historical standards. Uh, Biden reputedly is, you know, going to come in with some pretty strong ethics codes. So you can certainly try to shore it up through internal decision making processes. But really, this is a judicial problem at this point. The courts have ruled in really destructive ways, which have allowed money to have an outsized influence over politics in Washington. And until we find a way around that, whether it's a legislative workaround or whether it's new court rulings, but until we find a way around that, we're going to be dealing with a really dangerous level of big money in politics. Sasha Abramsky, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, writer for The Nation column, Signal Noise, also writes a regular column for Truth Out and is a professor of journalism at UC Davis. Thank you so much for joining us. Four weeks seems too long, but but hopefully we'll, it'll, it'll land before the end of the year. Well, if it doesn't, Happy New Year. And if it does, Merry holidays, and I'll see you when I see you. Thank you so much, and thanks for your contribution to ACT TV by being a regular guest here. I really appreciate it, and our, so do our viewers. So thanks so much. It's great to have you. Always fun. You're watching ACT TV. I'm Juliana Forlano. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Push the buttons, push the bell, turn the thing on. Give me a thumbs up. Also, I read all the comments. So if you have nice comments, could you put them in there? Because you, as it turns out, you actually don't have to encourage people to put in horrible comments they just do that for fun <laughs> and uh gives you kind of a weird picture i'm like all these people are watching and thumbing up but only people who think that donald trump is the god savior on the earth are making comments it's weird anyway thanks a lot for watching i appreciate it tomorrow we'll have for we're not we don't have time for the meme rundown because we went long in both the interviews but we'll have that for you tomorrow on our youtube page so keep an eye out for it thanks so much we'll see you tomorrow